Rachel, we were all talking about um, Trump stories in the morning. Yeah, it's a good. Oh, I mean, it's great. We, we are very, very happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were all talking about um, Trump stories in the morning. Yeah, it's a good. Oh, I mean, it's great. We, we are very, very happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, hello, Lauren. Hi, okay. sorry, I've, I've muted the live stream now. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, okay. So that's that's why last stream is like a few seconds later than lagged, right? Yeah, it's a, it's another glitch um, to add to Arda's talk on glitch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, a, a lot of people, particularly young people in the UK, they are all very happy with 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 the result. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I think it, uh, it's going to be for the better, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Been waiting for. Um, and we were forced to watch his draw, drama all the time, and I'm happy. You know, many of us are happy that we don't have to watch it anymore. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not only in the UK. Yeah. Everywhere. Um, but still, I can't believe. Still, there's a there's a thousand, uh, tenth of thousands of people uh, voting Trump anyway. I know. And, I know. I mean, this the divide, right? Really, yeah. the divide the gap is huge. I just, yeah, I don't understand how can you vote a liar? I, I just do not understand that. I just don't. Um, yes, I mean, people's expectation on politicians are just too low, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very uh, difficult. And it, it's same here that we don't understand why people here voted Brexit. Uh, we don't understand. Um, still, you know, um, as we say that uh, democracy is very messy. Um, okay, um, times, it, the time is for us to start, maybe. Um, shall I start, Lauren? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to the 13th, or, uh, 13th Annual Conference of CCVA. And we had uh, uh, two panels in the morning and a keynote speaker that uh, we enjoyed. Um, and in the afternoon, we will have a slightly uh, sort of shorter uh, uh, session, shorter panel with two speakers. Um, the reason uh, is that uh, one of our panel speakers are, are from the US and I appreciate that she uh, has to get up very early, you know, before seven o'clock to deliver the talk. And also uh, because of the online uh, delivery um, and we have to consider uh, different time zones and I know that in China it's nearly 11 o'clock so once this two has done that this is by midnight so uh, thank you for those who are staying with us particularly those from China and I promise you that we will get it done by 12 o'clock midnight um, so I will cut myself short and I will hand over to our first panel speaker, uh, Dr. Let me, let me try to pronounce your name. Um, Dr. Christina uh, Moraru. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah she, she's from uh, uh, George uh, uh, Anatu National University of the Arts in Romania. So it's time for you. Christina. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna talk today about art, life and labor in post-Covidism. The era of post-Covidism for me, as I understand it, started with the realization of the social, political, educational and cultural consequences of the novel coronavirus dissemination. And unfortunately, it does not designate an era of victory over our current pand pandemic crisis, but merely an era of realizing the actual consequences of capitalist glo globalization, which determined the emergence of the coronavirus pandemic. 
This moment of awareness mark, marks an era in which we can see clearly the ruins of our presence, as the Indian historian D.G. Prashud considers, an era in which we can understand how capitalist system caused climate catastrophes, wars, the division of society, job losses, poverty, while supporting investments and services in military system, mediating neoliberalism and its endemic crisis. We have to admit that capitalism determine our current pandemic crisis. With this realization, we now see how the era of post-Covidism is constituted as a time of interregnum, as Zygmunt Bauman remarks, quoting Antonio Gramsci, a time when power is being renegotiated and this crisis persists precisely, consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this moment of interregnum, we realize the mistakes we made in our current regime of surveillance capitalism. But let's recall how we end up in this situation. The new capitalist technologies that enable remote management and communication, computerization and global operation by spreading large factories across several regions in order to increase productivity and lower manufacturer costs have changed this Marxist order of uh, capital production in which human resources and the production territory held a key position. Now production is extended all over the world due to relatively low cost of transportation, while, while human resources are becoming inexhaustible and increasingly exploitable. Globally, capital accumulation is, run, is done through labor exploitation while the, mu the movement of capital remains similar to its structure in the colonial era, having capital flows from poor countries to rich countries and businesses delegating to, to underdeveloped countries where, from where they send capital to, to the center. As a result, rich countries are getting richer and poor countries are getting poorer. If the entire population of the world were to live like the people in the United States, we will need the global resources of another three globes in order to support their level of consumption. America, although it represents 5% of the entire world population, consumes more than a quarter of the Earth's energy. Meanwhile, globally, a child dies of hunger every 10 seconds, and the number of children dying from malnutrition is amounting to 22 million. The strategies of delegating production and investment used in global production change have allowed multinational companies not to invest profit in production factories. Moreover, multinationals that have invested money in the infrastructure of, of the factories in which they have delegated production processes collect profit from renting workspace to their employees. However, neither profit made by renting factories nor uh, profit made by production are reinvested. The profit is being speculated in financial scheme and, and it produces even more profit through the circulation of capital than through the production of goods themselves. Investors working at the level of this financial speculation have become the richest people on the planet. The, the wealth uh, owned by eight of these people is being equivalent to the subsum income of the of the half of the humanity, the one at, at the bottom of the welfare ranking. The huge profit is stored in a tax heaven, and this shows again the refusal of investment in production processes and in establishing a framework for protecting 
the worker status. In, 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 um, in other words, we, we can say that global capital is constantly expanding, reducing its contribution to public funds, which increase the pressure on the state and its financial management. Consequently, the state operates wage cuts and reduces um, from public spending, while the cost of globalization as are, is being borne by, by society. More than this, the new global geography of production reduces even more the power of the worker, abolishing the institutional framework that protects their rights, like trade unions, and remove, removing the possibility of nationalizing certain parts of the production process. Consequently, the worker condition change from worker producer active in industrial societies to worker consumer in postmodern society and now to teleworker under the regime of coronavirus. Even more, a new geography of production materializes as a new geography of distribution is speculated. Both the production and the distribution processes are designated with the intention of protecting the most valuable resource of multinational companies, which is the capital. This shift towards teleworking happened drastically and even more efficiently under the regime of coronavirus than under the capitalist regime where change is imposed by the new liberal system that envision multiple possibility of digitalizing different aspects of life with, with this intention to increase consumption. The teleworker is consequently a digital consumer, is constantly encouraged to purchase online so that it can be better monitorized. More than this, this shift towards teleworking made us rethink the attributes of our working space. Labor is now occupying a domestic space. And this domestic space become the center of production, consumption and political control. The pandemic evolution has favored the efficiency of control mechanism regulating the body understood as, as a central object of all politics, given that the very task of political action is to regulate the body to define its modes of production and reproduction. And here, of course, I have to mention Foucault and his notion of biopolitics, which involves a form of power that regulates life by instrumenting different mechanisms of controlling bioprocesses at the level of specific governmental techniques of security or sanitation. In his article, Learning from the Virus, Spanish philosopher Paul Preciado noticed how different form of biopolitical and necropolitical management were already present before the emergence of the new coronavirus pandemic, regulating over sexual, racial, or migrant minorities. But now our current pandemic situation radicalizes biopower, biopolitical techniques by incorporating them at the level of the individual body. By adopting different uh, biopolitical techniques, the individual becomes an instrument through which power is being disseminated. And this situation is extrapolated at a global level, given that the coronavirus pandemic extends political measures of sanitation to the whole society, of the, to the whole population of the world, applying restriction that until then ha had been used only to, to those excluded. By citing Foucault, Preciado analyzes the transi transition from leper management to, to plague management investigated different processes through which disciplinary techniques of sanitation were deployed in modernity. While leopard 
had been treated with strictly necropolitical measures that condemned them to a life outside the community, early modern efforts to control plague instituted biopolitical measure of confinement uh, that isolated each individual in their home in the same manner that we experience them today in our current pandemic situation. However, if for Foucault, power has retreated to a position of surveillance in a simultaneous invisibility from where it manifests itself periodically and circumstantially, for Slavoj Žižek, power is now being reconfigured at a level of a network of capitalist institution. Inside this capitalist network, power is no longer becoming even more efficient through mechanism of observation, but through its perpetual mechanism of dissemination that generates different instances of power coagulated mainly around the capital. However, these instances of power need politics to stabilize their position of authority. In other words, the capital needs to delegate its authority to politics. At this level, Slavoj Žižek, in his article Living in Times of Monsters, it identifies a fundamental contradiction in postmodern capitalism. Its logic is anti-state, deregulatory, but its tendency is to straighten state's role, whose regulatory function is increasingly present. The state must be straightened in order to function in favor of the capital and its authority must be preserved so that in the event of a national or natural disaster, pandemic or, or some ecological catastrophes, which uh, implicitly caused uh, an economic crisis, the state can therefore administer economic needs through its political decision by implementing austerity measures and maintaining a capitalist logic. Periods of crisis confirm the needs of involving politics and as, as an authority capable of suspending democracy. Ironically, the most effective regime of organization during an emergency situation is the autocratic one. The lack of political debate is favoring the elaboration of an emergency plan. But even when democracy is suspended, the tendency to maintain the global dynamics of capital survives. Any local initiative uh, is being countered by a fear of totalitarian degeneration, while any initiative aimed at prospering the state continue to be attacked under the arguments of lack of competitiveness, which could uh, determine uh, an economic crisis. This distrust is specific for times of interregnum and its logic of risk assessment in which we, we need one feels both fear of past regimes and reluctance uh, about the security offered by, by our current regime. On the one hand, Slavoj Žižek states, states that with the end of co communism, humanity abandoned utopian desires, accepting the, the constraints of capitalist reality. Today's evil is so global that it can no longer be defeated. On the other hand, this moment of interregnum could materialize reactionary and could restore a communal project. And the, in this restruc restructuration, art can have an important role. Art uh, as a revolutionary politics of the sensible redefines the relation between capitalism and the sensible world. The work of art constituting itself as a work of thinking generates a particular experience of freedom determined at the level of intersection between rational and sensible thinking and non-thinking. The aesthetic revolution imposes a way of transforming the regimes of thinking about art 
generating um, what Rancière calls a specific form of freedom, inaccessible at the level of our governmental politics, but manifested at the level of a particular type of politics, the politics of the sensible. In his article, The Aesthetic Revolution and Its Outcomes, Rancière talks about the politics of the sensible, which by determining a specific sensory experience, the aesthetics, holds the promise of a better world for life and individual, but also for art. And this new world will be instituted through an aesthetic revolution, a revolution that will no longer be merely formal or political, it will be a human revolution. And for us here, the human revolution is the offspring of the aesthetic paradigm. More than this, uh, this revolution instituted through aesthetic means will have a metapolitical factor, given that aesthetics has its own way of doing politics, different from those specific to diplomatic policy making. This change of perspective can only be approached in an interconnected system of art, materiality, and life governed by metapolitics. According to Ranciere, the revolution of the sensible makes that everything is material for art, so that art is no longer governed by its subjects, and the aesthetic revolution determining an extension to infinity of the realm of language, of poetry. In this sense, art becomes poetry and poetry becomes life. This is the part of instituting the politics of the sensible, which holds the promise of, the better, of a better world. Thank you. Thank you very I much. And positively. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Okay. This is fascinating. And there's a lot of uh, 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 theories and debates that we can think of. And um, can we leave um, the, the question and answer session uh, at the end? So we can invite our second speaker, uh, Mei Ching, to present. And after that, we will have 30 minutes for, uh, for discussion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Professor Wang Mei Ching, can we invite you to uh, give us the talk, please? Of course. Thank you, Joshua. And hello, everyone again. I, my topic actually, I'm glad to have this opportunity to present the paper concerning the law of visual, uh, uh, visual images in facilitating Chinese people to inform each other and sharing my screen, express their criticism. Am I sharing this successfully? Do you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes, it's, it's fine. Right. Yes, it's good. So my, my presentation is very down to earth and related with what's happening in China just early this year. And I look into how visual images actually informed or uh, helped facilitate the Chinese people to inform each other, express their creativity and their criticism, preserve truth, and mobilize online protests during the outbreak of COVID-19. I started with the breaking the rule of positive energy. Positive energy has been a major official discourse concerning public opinion management since 2012 with the coming of Xi Jinping administration. In China's effort to curtail the spread of COVID that originated from Wuhan city at the eve of the Chinese New Year, positive energy figured prominently in official media reports. News one after another were broadcasted nationwide, praising the effective leadership of Chinese government and the willing self-sacrifice of medical professionals and other citizens in combating the pandemic. Too much positive propaganda, however, could lose its appeal and even backfire. In one instance, uh, in mid-February, mid-February, a government-owned newspaper in Gansu province posted a video of female medics being shaped collectively as they prepared to go to the epic center of the pandemic. It was one of the many news pieces produced by the mainstream media to sing praise to medical team's positive energy. However, public reaction to this post was extremely negative as netizens blasted the media for humiliating women. 
the widespread criticism forced the news agency to remove the post. The protest against the misspent positive energy in official media actually continued the momentum of online protest at the peak at the death of Dr. Liu Wenliang on February 7th. Via social media, Chinese people had been trying to inform each other the whereabouts of the pandemic and participating in a civic effort to uncover the truth about this uh, outbreak. It became clear that there was a chance for the Wuhan authorities to prevent the outbreak. If immediate actions were taken in response to the early warning in late December 2019 from a doctor named Li Wenliang, unfortunately, instead of being taken seriously, he was punished by Wuhan police for spreading rumors. He received the national attention one month later when China's top court openly criticized the Wuhan police for punishing him and other Wuhan doctors who tried to warn about the virus and became recognized as a whistleblower. By that time, however, he was diagnosed with coronavirus infection and he died on February 7th. His death stimulated nationwide outcry, sadness and anger spread among medicines, compounded by the continuous increase of death toll from the virus, leading them to openly criticize China's lack of freedom of speech. His premature death at the age of 34, as put by a writer, has unleashed an unprecedented tsunami of grief and anger that probably has not been seen since President Xi lost to power. For example, by 6 a.m. that day, only several hours after the official announcement of his death, the hashtags Dr. Li Wenliang passed away received 670 million views. And I Want the Freedom Speech had 2.86 million views. These inspiring numbers speak to the people who not only viewed but also retweeted the posts during their sleepless night waiting to be updated with Lee's condition. All these posts employed Lee's selfies and sometimes the letter of reprimand that he received from the Wuhan police. They became public images as people forwarded them as a way to express their grief, anger and frustration. At the passing of this doctor and the political system that silenced him. Along the, with these posters, his remarks to a reporter, I think several days before his death, there should be more than one voice in a healthy society was widely resonated. The momentum of grief and anger built up so rapidly and the demand for freedom of speech so intense that the authorities quickly stepped in, splitting all posters. Following government censorship, another surge of image mobilization began this time by artists who developed their own images based on Li's selfies, a drawing titled Pandemic Fighting Hero Li Wenliang based on his selfie was an often circulated image, not only for online morning events, but also for a few memorials staged in real life. Mask became a new symbol of commemoration, discontent and criticism. Numerous images were created or uh, appropriated to commemorate he, him as well as to point to the lack of freedom of speech in, in the political system. No one would expect, however, that another even stronger wave of anti-censorship protests would soon emerge, this time surrounding Dr. Ai Fen, a colleague of Dr. Li, starting March 10th, a which had posted the title, Today is the most ridiculous day since the first WeChat public account went viral. This post is a collection of more than 50 versions of an interview article titled The One Who hand, Handed Out the Whistles, published online on March 9th by Chinese People magazine on Dr. Ai Fen. The article reveals that I was the first doctor to share information about SARS like virus diagnosis in her hospital. In a report, she recalls that she received harsh treatment from her hospital for manufacturing rumors. She expressed her regret with a defined statement. If I had known what was to happen, I would not have cared about the treatment. I would have take, uh, talked it to whoever and whatever I could. This daring interview article only appeared several hours before it was recycled, uh, before it was rejected by its publisher. That was too late. Though. An extraordinary cycle, uh, cyber warfare against the censorship ensued. With the article accompanied by Dr. I's photo and the defined statement as the focal point, 
Chinese netizens feverishly tweeted the article, but their tweets were quickly expunged by the authorities. Netizens pushed back by reformatting the article in various means to avoid censorship, starting with the usual tactics, such as screenshots, deliberate typos, pinging, foreign languages. When these methods failed, they resorted to unusual tactics, such as making it into a song using Oracle Bomb script, emoji, blockchain, mouse code, QR code, and even fictional languages to revive the deleted post. By then, of course, it was no longer about the readability of the content itself, since many of these posts were not legible, but about rejecting being silenced. Some described it as a life and death battle with the censors as if to preserve a fleeting but precious memory. Some began calling it a mass performance art as they consciously participated in posting and reposting it. Efforts to record this massive performance were also being report, uh, reposted an image that uh, compiled various versions of the post into the profile of Dr. I was tweeted by some art professionals as one of the best artworks of the year. Commemorating on this online momentum of activism, the writer states that these ingenious workarounds mark a determination not to be silenced, not to allow the truth to be swept away on Xi Jinping's type of positive energy. What foregrounded the Chinese people's unusual defiant creativity in early 2020 was a conscious protest against the government's attempt to monopolize how the pandemic should be interpreted and remembered. In a sense, they were participating in the history and memory of the pandemic from below in the making. Participating in the history and memory of the pandemic from below in the making is also the motivation behind several public image making projects initiated right before or during waves of, uh, of the grassroots online visual campaigns. Professionals call for public participation in order to reflect critically the nature of this major public health crisis or construct a collective documentation our personal expressions and the lived experiences during the pandemic. One such work is Master Book. It's an ongoing global public artwork initiated by Chinese artist Wen Fang back in 2015 in collaboration with Art of Change 21, an international association of artists and environmental activists. The idea was to invite people making their own unique facial masks either digital or real, to express their understanding of the connection between climate change and health problems, and to propose solutions through which they could transform the mask, a isolating protect tool into a symbol of connection and civic action. Since its launch on occasion of the 2015 United Nations Climate Change Conference in Paris, Mask Book has collected thousands of photos of masks from participants all over the world. Many ha have uh, used recycled materials such as plastic and electronic waste to remind of the cause of the increasing severe environmental and health problems. While a work aiming to tackle environmental problems global wide, Mask Book was first inspired by one's experience living in a highly polluted city of Beijing, as well as by China's censorship. She explains, in China, since we all wear masks to protect us against the pollution, we say the Facebook for us should be renamed Master Book. Even the Facebook is censored in China, Wen's explanation has a sense of irony here. No matter how powerful the government is, it cannot censor air pollution nor health problems. When COVID hit China, this global public artwork made a domestic turn as we launched a special campaign for public participation in China to address the health crisis via creative masks. On January 29th, she circulated an open call inviting Chinese people to create masks, not for the purpose of self-preservation, but for training their ability to independently express themselves when facing major crises such as COVID. Reflecting on the mask wearing practice as Chinese people went through SARS, smog, and now coronavirus, she asks, why do we have to put on masks again and again? Why are we always so 
reactive rather than proactive when dealing with problems. Here, she's referring to the lack of proactivity in addressing environmental and health problems at the resource level. She hopes that this public art project can serve as a platform to promote proactive thinking and creative expression among Chinese people when in, at the same time encourage them to dig deep into the factors that contributed to the pandemic. Within days of her call, she received hundreds of submissions either made it digitally or with real objects and then photographed from all over China. A lot of these photos continue expressing anger and grief that were allowed to circulate in public by the authorities using metaphors, symbols. Many also conveyed critiques that the of the censorship, concerns of the destruction human societies have inflicted upon the Earth's ecosystem, compassions for human and animal sufferings, or hope for solitary and support to overcome the pandemic, among others. Wen Fang was presently surprised with the turnout because since the launch of Mass Book in 2015, the participation of Chinese dead citizens had been rare. She said that even most of her friends did not think it would be useful to participate in such a grassroots public art project, indicating a common social mentality are waiting for top-down official directives to make social changes. In 2020, however, they seem to be a rising recognition or desire uh, to take small actions at the grassroots level to express personal voice and to foster broaden the changes via artistic means. One more day is another example that I illustrate, I illustrate here. It's a civic documentary project launched by MeDoc, literally big elephant documentary in Chinese, in early February that also involved a public image making campaign that embraced the value of daily observations and experiences from ordinary people. Founded aloud around 2013, MeDoc is a Shanghai based documentary production team that has focused on documenting the lives of ordinary people who they believe to be often, uh, often marginalized in mainstream culture and artistic production in order to make them the protagonists who can tell their own stories and true experience of living in contemporary China. The One More Day project, however, endeavors to hand over the power of documenting to ordinary citizens themselves. Qin Xiaoyu, a co-founder of MeDoc, and the initiator of One More Day argues that the private life and the space of ordinary people have been left out from media reportage, which is focused on hospitals, the government, and frontline quarantine facilities. Qin decided to produce a documentary centering on ordinary people's experiences during this challenging time. On February 5th, he released an official call for public participation, he writes. On February 9th, yes, one ordinary day, please pick up a device and record a special moment of yours at any time of the day. You can be alone or with family, loved ones, or colleagues. In a call, he specifies that the two to five minutes long footage submission can be raw or edited pieces and emphasized. It does not matter whether you shoot like a professional or not. We are seeking the precious truth true and heartfelt feelings revealed in real life. He announces that the submissions will be selected and edited into the documentary, and those whose footages are chosen will be credited as the co-directors of this special documentary. Documenting, he states, is to write history for the future, which is important because we are too forgetful and easy to repeat the same mistakes. Documenting by ordinary people, therefore, he implies, can serve as hard evidence for future society to look back and learn from history. His open call was met with enthusiastic responses, and his team received more than 3,000 crypt submissions from around 5,000 people within days, which again reflects the rising desire to participate in civic image-making projects among Chinese people during these early Mondays of 2020. In the materials can cover a wide range of things such as daily life in isolation at home or in those people who are in quarantine, the changing urban and rural environment, professionals such as reporters and medics performing duties, and COVID-19 patients in the middle of recovery. 
in his review of the footages, Qin reflects that while there are many sentimental moments, they are often expressed not in a melodramatic way, such as movies and TV dramas, but in seemingly nonchalant daily, uh, daily activities and quietness. Some footages captured moments of uncertainty, helplessness, sadness, and frustration, which were also real emotional experiences many people endured as they tried to cope with new circumstances of living. Such heterogeneous and many times not so positive images naturally contradict the official interpretation of the pandemic, which aims to construct a homogeneous and positive narrative of all Chinese people united under the leadership of the government in China's winning battle against the virus. To conclude, happening right in the middle of the pandemic, Chinese citizens' quick response and enthusiastic participation in the creative protests against the censorship and in artistic projects, honoring grassroots voice, demonstrate the rising civic awareness and the collective action to construct a visual history of the pandemic from below. Despite or exactly because of political system that denies citizens' right to know beyond what is sanctioned by the state, visual images created by citizens and artists bear strong political significance with their potential to challenge the official media discourse since they formulated various alternative visual systems of knowledge. Their very existence forms a cultural visual narrative and serves as a challenge to the knowledge system produced and promoted by the powerful, by the powerful state concerning the interpretation of the pandemic. Resonating Dr. Lee's remarks, there should be more than one voice in a healthy society. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mei Ching, uh, for your wonderful talk. Um, and it's so rich. There are so many things that we can discuss further. Um, I, I wonder I could um, just let the floor to ask questions first. Uh, I know that there are people at the uh, YouTube as well. Um, and any questions to ask? Um, for either Christina or Mei Ching. Hi, can I ask a question for Mei Ching? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks very much uh, for your talk, Professor uh, Mei <laughs> Wang, is that, sorry. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, the visual history from below is very interesting. And all the examples that you have talked about are digital images, they are digital visual images. I was wondering if you could talk about this digital dimension, how is this type of visual representation and mediation different from say print media or that type of visual representation? Thanks. Okay, that's a great question. Although I haven't thought much about that, uh, but I think uh, during this time that uh, everybody's at home, right? The availability of digital technology just really came in you know, great help. I would imagine if you know, the pandemic happened 10 years ago, like it was SARS, like, I mean, the, the yeah. public visual mobilization was so different because yeah. there was no convenience of digital technology available yeah. there. So the way I see it, you know, the, 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 these projects are able to really mobilize a lot of participation and this like Protest, online protests could happen is because of the convenience of digital mm -hmm. technology, especially WeChat. Right? Mm -hmm. So I think it really that benefited uh, a great deal. Mm -hmm. I think in a sense, uh, we are lucky that we have uh, the, the technology that of course government utilized to their purpose, but people also utilize digital technology to their purpose. And I, 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 I truly appreciate, for this, for that perspective, I truly appreciate that we have this. Although there are a lot of problems that associated with like, the digital technology scholars are talking about that, but no, I mean, it's a battle, right? It's like a tool. We can make use it for, no, for, 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 for our purpose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Uh, when I listen to those two colleagues uh, talk, particularly Mei Ching's, I recall the uh, the speech by uh, the the, uh, the vice president uh, 
Kamala um, a few days ago, is that two days ago, that uh, saying that because people has chosen Biden, therefore they chose um, they chose hope, they chose they chose unity, decency, and what science and and truth, um, and you can see that there is a lot lot of truth are hidden, um, and it has to be translated in a, a creatively and artistically in a different way through various social media. Otherwise, it will be buried uh, by uh, or censored uh, by, by those kind of um, uh, mechanism. And I, I wonder, um, uh, the, the, uh, Mei Ching, you know that there is a, a interesting um, calligrapher that I'm following uh, who was uh, making some critical comments about the COVID-19, but it was censored very quickly. And therefore he wrote um, uh, the, the comments in a style of uh, Cao Shu, uh, running script. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, uh, and took a, a photograph. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the text becomes uh, turned into images and therefore that it's not it's no longer sensible. Um, that, that was a very interesting uh, piece. I can send you some, uh, some images as well, um, which okay. was uh, quite uh, a phenomenon um, in, in the, uh, in, in particularly in WeChat um, uh, situation. Yeah, um, thank you, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, Christina, uh, you, you were talking about uh, how government uh, regulating uh, the body can you share a bit more about this and how do you see um, people reg regulating the body or, or the people uh, in the so-called uh, democratic country and less democratic country? Uh, how, do you, how do you observe uh, the differences uh, and the similarities between them? Yes, thank, thank you for this question. I think this problematic of regulating the body introduced um, this no notion of the sovereign body that Foucault theorized it. And um, uh, during different uh, regime, we experience different manners of regulating the body, of fabricating the body in accordance to different political situation. And in our current pandemic situation, we see how, how, how we, um, this uh, tendency of regulating the body becomes efficient. And this happened not, not only uh, today in, in the coronavirus pandemic, this, this, you can follow uh, um, a tradition of, uh, of uh, approaching uh, the body in, in, in relation to epidemic situation. Uh, let's take, for example, uh, the syphilis epidemic in uh, 1494, where, where um, the body uh, fa fabricated by the disciplinary regime were trying to, to, con to control uh, this syphilis epidemic. And the body that was fabricated by the disciplinary regimes were, were, was, was namely the, the white bourgeois body sexually confined in a marriage life. And uh, its roles were defined by its um, uh, function of reproduction. So we, we see now this happening um, today, but it also happened in previous times. And I, I will maybe refer here to Paul Preciado um, and uh, his article, Learning from the Virus, in which he states that uh, in the late uh, 20th century, we had the same situation with the AIDS pandemic. Uh, Preciado noticed how uh, the AIDS uh, epidemic, sorry, the AIDS epidemic had the same impact to heteronormative neoliberal society 
the same impact that the syphilis had to colonial capitalism during, during early modernity. So we kind of see the same response of regulating the, the body in different times and throughout the history. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, and I know that there are questions from uh, uh, oh. Xiao Yi. Um, can you see me? Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Zhang, also organizing this. Actually, I'm thinking my question is both a question for Professor Wang and uh, and also Professor Zhang. Um, because, um, like, my I will present tomorrow about also um, is a work related to what Professor Wang has just talked about. Um, it was like the action of Song Bie Li Wen Liang. So, and when you present like the images uh, composed like by the different hectares for uh, Dr. Ai Fen or different kind of like folk um, visual images online, I think they actually, they are in the same genre. But when I was dealing with um, this material, I have been thinking also because we are presenting in a conference like this is already in an art context. But actually looking through this material um, and also discussing them actually can't force into like um, visual culture or like um, communication, this kind of field. So I have been thinking um, like when we deal with such kind of material, um, maybe from like the pers perspective as um, like art history or curatorial researcher, um, in what sense like we are claiming them to be art or because maybe people when they are doing this, they didn't they don't consider this as art themselves. And so that is some question how has been um, like hunted me for a long time because one I naturally I acknowledge that okay this is like the best artwork for me like this year. But this is not recognized by the conductor or by many people who are receiving it. Yeah, so that's kind of my um, confusion now. Like, uh, like in what sense, why this is important? Um, it can be seen as art. Um, and, and if it is important, what is it? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so shall I go first? Yes, please. Okay, yeah. Uh, I am researching on socially engaged, socially engaged art, right? So from my perspective, writing about art, it never worries, worries me or bothers me that whether a, a, a image project or even a, a social practice that people are doing is art or not art, because uh, for me, really, that, that, that doesn't bother me at all. This, the, the, Every conventional or they establish the standard of what art is, what art is not, it really doesn't doesn't bother me. Um, in particular, because a lot of people, artists and art professionals, are looking to they actually are no, they don't care about whether what they, they are doing is art or not art, but they happen to uh, work within right the context of art. So yes, uh, they oftentimes they talk about. Uh, within the framework of art, but also at the same time, they are eager and happily actually just go out beyond the bottom of art. So for me, right, what, what a project is worth of a serious uh, research, it's really related with whether it actually responds to what's going on and whether it actually try to make relevance to the current situation. So that's when I like uh, look around a lot of uh, phenomenon, a lot of uh, artistic efforts, and, and that's how actually I pick what I want to spend more effort in uh, researching, understanding what's going on. And of course, sometimes you look into, you may don't find that that, that kind of, uh, your expectation will change, right? But that's, I think that that's part of, uh, I think the water that we are in, especially for me doing uh, researching on socially engaged art. They, this, I mean, you always have to, um, deal with whether right, a particular project in need it. indeed right it's engaging right? uh, and what, yeah what kind of standard right they are like level one level two level three so I think that's like a question I actually constantly uh, 
I'm still I'm still into it. I'm still learning. Yeah, maybe I could like maybe add a bit more to the question because um one I came up with this question not from my point of view. It's because when I claim this to be art, I find many like friends they are not in the art field or people who uh, have done this um like like creations. They don't consider them to be art, and they find me considering to be to be art is very limiting or actually offensive yeah so that is like the one the situation i was thinking like how if i'm calling the art like what i'm trying to make of that or, or what i'm trying to say yeah thank you and i totally understand like um what you said about um yeah there's no limitation like about uh, many artists doing the things they want like without considering them to be art or not yeah um, they are, okay sorry go ahead sorry um i i agree with what mei ching just um uh, introduced and um and i think there's no by no means that why i want to undermine the achievement of any artists but um when you see uh, the images that Mei Qing just shared um, uh, around the case of um, iPhone, um, you can see the creative energy, you know, behind the images, and and it's it's more interesting. It's it's spontaneously happened. Um, you know, no no one asked them to do that, and this is um, this is also we need to thank um, the censorship. Uh, in China, uh, otherwise you won't be able to see this kind of uh, uh, creativities. Um, and as I, as we think that when you say art, you know, when you're trying to claim they are art, but anything when it can be categorized as piece of art, it's dead. You know, it's already dead. It's it's a kind of it's less interesting. Um, it's it, to me, it's more interesting that you you find um, you find it challenging uh, to put into a particular category. Um, I've just done a, a, an editorial for our next uh, special issue of the journal, which is on uh, the um, contemporary Chinese art in the context of uh, um, urban transformations. And I, and I thought I've got uh, a lot of uh, colleagues, uh, writers writing about art uh, in that particular context. Um, and in the end editorial instead, I was writing about extensively about uh, a restaurant called Wen He Yu. I don't know any of you have been to Wen He Yu in Changsha, it's phenomenal. The, the, the owners and the designers, they don't see themselves as, as contemporary artists, but, <laughs> The projects, it's more than contemporary art. It's, it's full of energy, full of uh, um, uh, interesting thinking behind it. And I call it uh, like anti-memory, you know, uh, trying to stop people thinking about the past, but put themselves back into the past and so on. So this is something that's really interesting in contemporary China, I would say. It's not, it's not uh, something that you can easily find in other countries, in other in any other uh, political and cultural um, context. Um, I've got another question from you. Uh, oh, before that, um, Federico was waiting, Joshua. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, um, I'm jumping the gun. Um, Lauren. Also to... uh, sorry, I uh, also wanted to say something in relation yeah, to this question, but yeah. No, please, please do, please do. Please go ahead, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay. So thank you for this question. I think it's relevant because we nowadays, given the, the current pandemic situation, we need to reevaluate what is art because we are now approaching art through different, different mediums. We approach art online. And in these accelerated times of, of um, um, uh, image dynamism, uh, that is um, uh, that is favoring a, a dissemination of images in uh, through the internet. We, we now have to have to ask um, what to ask ourselves again. What what is art? Because when we approach um, an art 
object through its online dissemination, it becomes what Hito Steyer um, envisioned in her article in defense of the poor images. It, it becomes um, a for, uh, uh, just a reminder of its former visual selves since it does not have enough materiality to be considered an object of contemplation. So I, I uh, wanted to, to bring Hito Steyer uh, into discussion because uh, she is analyzing how uh, art, uh, work of art distributed online now are becoming just theoretical objects and they are different in their nature from, from the contemplation objects they, uh, they once used to be. So we are now in this situation, in this pandemic situation that favors the circulation of images. And maybe this is a good thing at, as Hito Steyer want to preserve a positive attitude towards this, but it also um, hinder the quality of of the image, so that that is uh, problematic. Thank you, Christina. Um, Lauren, would you like to bring us back to Federica? Federica, do you want to talk? Yes, thank you. Um, so my question is actually probably addressed to both uh, the presenters. Um, also, thank you for your wonderful presentations, I really enjoyed them very much. Um, so um, but perhaps I would first address directly Professor Wang. Uh, I was particularly interested in the film project by Jin Xiaoyu and about how he wants to somehow capture how um, ordinary people are experiencing the pandemic and so probably also the lockdown measures, etc. Uh, but I think this is relevant also for for Christina, because that has a lot to do with how biopolitics actually work. Um, so I was wondering, um, I'm not sure, I didn't understand whether this project is finished, whether we actually have, uh, whether we can actually see the film or whether it's still being produced, but in any way, um, I'm curious about what we can find in ordinary, in ordinary individuals' lives and in how they react to the pandemic and to restrictive measures put in place by governments. Because sometimes we tend to think of them, of, of, of individual reactions as perhaps alternative to, um, to master narratives, to dominant narratives, etc. But I'm not sure whether that is always the case. Uh, um, I wonder whether sometimes there can also be, for example, acceptance of something that we would perceive as authoritarian, etc. And if I may share a, a very short anecdote, uh, I was tutoring a translation class some weeks ago, and we were debating, we were translating uh, slogans from the Chinese government propaganda campaign on. Um, you know, on uh, epidemic prevention. And uh, at, uh, we were, we were uh, having trouble in translating because trust the government. If you say trust the government, perhaps in any European country, but we were talking about Italy, you would think that there's something wrong with the government, right? <laughs> the government tells you to trust the government, there's something wrong. And so we were debating on how to translate it. And a lot of people actually, um, so I objected like this, right? So you, you perhaps you should think of a better translation. And uh, uh, some of the students objected that no, they, they would actually be fine with government telling them to trust the government because right now we are in an awful situation and so we need to trust the government. And that would be like an ordinary individual's reaction. So to wrap up my question, uh, what do you think we can find of interesting in ordinary people's lives in the, in, in, during, during the pandemic? Is it, uh, are they necessarily alternative reactions or is it more, more complicated from your point of view? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Federico, for uh, your question and also for the, the story that you shared. I mean, uh, Chinese government runs an extraordinary uh, 
public opinion management program, extraordinarily. So there's no surprise, I would say the majority uh, Chinese people, especially those who, uh, let's say like in the maybe less cosmopolitan, right? That's Shanghai, Beijing, in like secondly, thirdly, and vast rural regions, Chinese people, most of them believe in what the government says, and they believe the government is trustworthy. That's you no, know, I think the result of this extraordinary public opinion management. The government has spent no effort dealing with that. So uh, no surprise, not surprise, um, no surprise that a lot of materials come in. Uh, are uh, dealing with people who following government's guidelines, like doing what they're supposed to do, isolating themselves or yeah, going to the front like, to help as part of, of uh, that's how they identify themselves with like, the nation, with China. I think it's because of that, right? They are, they are other voice, right? which of all those is minor, but they are valuable because they, I mean, the, the government voice is so powerful and the majority are in support of government. And it, it actually make those, you know, a little bit un, un, noisy voice, like an odd voice that not so in harmonious with government's uh, discourse, valuable. Yeah, but I totally agree with you. I mean, not necessarily like grassroots voice is an alternative of the mainstream media, not at all. A lot of them are actually in alignment with it's because they are just shaped, right? Their opinion is shaped by you know, the public official public opinion management program. That's how they that's how they inform themselves. Right? So that's the only thing they know. Um Mei Ching, when you are still here, I've got another question on the uh, chat bar. Um, can you read it or I can read it for you? Um, because there are audience on the YouTube, I, I, I would rather read it. Basically, uh, it was t talking about, uh, you know, in terms of the age range and gender uh, of those uh, uh, grassroots uh, creative practitioners making uh, the visual science and so on, and whether, uh, how do you observe uh, the younger generation, let's say post 90, uh, post 2000 born, um, young people uh, who, um, in her view, is a kind of born with the censorship. Uh, censorship is part of their life, um, and I don't. I don't know whether this is um, there is a need to cut either uh, year two thousand or nineteen ninety nine. I was born with the censorship. I was old enough. I came from the last century. I was born with the censorship all the time, um, but. Do we see censorship as part of our everyday? Um, I remember that when I was talking to one of the participants, uh, Chen Danqing, in our online re um, uh, research seminar, he was talking about the censorship and uh, people stopping things happening and people find a creative way to respond to that. He called it as a comedy. Um, it's uh, And the people, uh, the, 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 the censorship, the authority, uh, controller, they enjoy the process. And at the same time, uh, those who are making sort of uh, visual alternatives, they enjoy the process too. It's a kind of game. What's your view on this? I, I also, I was born in the 1970s. So definitely I grew up with censorship. I did not know there was censorship, you know. <laughs> I grew <laughs> up with that, I had no idea until I, uh, until certainly a certain time I realized, okay, there was censorship all over. So in a sense, I think the younger generation actually they experience censorship in various forms that they become even more aware of that. Like you have know, WeChat post, they got deleted, you know, there's a censorship. But back then we did not even know, right? So I think the younger generation, they have a stronger awareness of that. And uh, uh, the, the earlier part of the question is about the survey of those grassroots participation. I'm not uh, aware of this any survey being done, but the in terms of gender for the like the one I look at the mask book, right? A lot of young people, children are participating. Of course, we can assume they actually were maybe you know in conversation with their parents. By parenting, you see this kind of participation is cross uh, age, right? and also in mask book I reviewed a lot of submissions. Uh, I mean, of course, I forgot to count, right? But I see a lot of women and men. So I, I would not think there's like a, a gender kind of uh, 
pattern here. It probably is more about the, anybody who has the tool and has the interest to make an image. Mm. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't know whether there's any survey not specific about them who, mm. uh, who participated, except for those they, they collected. So that's the, the kind of the, the surface that you, you can look at. Thank you. Um, and there is a question from uh, Jennifer Wallens. Um, Jennifer, is this question to Christina? Um, um. Yeah, I, the, the, the question was the pandemic has put a spotlight on digital divide in the UK, basically talking about uh, the accessibility to the internet uh, and whether this will affect people's everyday practice. So Jennifer is saying that this applies to making conclusions. Mm -hmm. So it's well, the question looks like it's uh, for for me. So digital, right. yeah. digital but divide. In the oh. meantime, can, can I say something about censorship? Because I think this uh, problematic of censorship relates also to to what Federico was saying earlier about biopolitics, because we see censorship as an instrument for, for both uh, biopolitics and necropolitics. And we have sen censorship in, in both uh, sovereign society, a society which is uh, commanding a sort of ritualization of that. So it's, it's structured through necropolitics, but also in disciplinary societies where we see uh, a, a structuring of society in accordance to biopolitics and to this intention of maximizing life of the population in accordance to the national interest. So I think censorship is, is, is present in all these uh, different, different structures. Yes. Um, um, uh, Jennifer, Sorry, I, I fear, it took me a while. To, yeah. yeah. I see what you meant. Um, I, I did have uh, uh, discussed this with one of uh, uh, the, uh, the participants in the, in the research seminars. That's Wang Shouzhi, who is a designer and a design uh, theory um, theorist. And we are talking about, um, you know, a lot of design were uh, made for uh, less capable people, for example, who are blind or who have um, eyesight problem or who is disabled, who couldn't work, walk. Um, but uh, when we are talking about pandemic, when people are relying on internet uh, access, access, uh, access um, and like green cold in China, and people need to have the apps to take the transportation and so on. And there is uh, uh, 500 million people who don't even have uh, a mobile phone uh, in China. And these people are, are sort of overlooked, if not ignored during the design process. And this is something that all the designers need to be aware of uh, for the practice. And um, the, 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 it's, it's particularly uh, urgent uh, for, for the, the, these people who are uh, suffering uh, from this pandemic a moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, Meijing, you want to say something? So, uh, just to follow follow up with you, you are talking already talking uh, responding to the question from Jennifer, right? Yeah, digital divide, just like uh, you know the divide of the, the divide, the social divide, the cultural divide, the economic divide, divide that has been you know, produced by China's you know urban center, the uh, market driven social economic development. So the divide, the world gap is really expanding. Although the 
talk that I gave today focused on digital activism, right? But in general, uh, when I look at the socially engaged art, that is a practice that where a lot of artists and art professionals try to bridge the divide, right? In various means, digital um, technology one way in a certain use at certain circumstances during uh, the pandemic, but uh, in other uh, in other occasions, they had to go to very remote areas uh, in order to make things happen. Like one important uh, component of socially engaged art that I look into is arts-based and lowly construction. Uh, it's less about the digital technology, it's about really going to you know, area, remote areas and see what you can do, understand what's going on there and see what you can do in order to expand you know, the potential of art. So again, it's, uh, the idea is about expanding, you know? the reach of art to as you know, broad the publics as possible. Okay, um, thank you very much, everyone. We kind of finished on time, just four minutes past uh, four o'clock as we uh, proposed um, for, the, for, the, for the end of the, uh, today's um, uh, conference. I have to say that I miss the time that we can gather together physically and uh, uh, Mei Qing was one of our, was the only actually uh, keynote speakers last year when we hold the conference in Tate Liverpool. And uh, one of the uh, uh, pleasure that we had uh, for the conference is that every uh, conference on, on each day, we will have conference dinner. We invite all the contributors uh, to, to join us for dinner and we drink together. And it's, it's such a, uh, we, we call it, um, academic party. Uh, so each year, uh, CCVA, Center for Chinese Visual Arts, we organize that uh, for the scholars all over the world to gather together. So we share, uh, we, we exchange and we celebrate. Um, unfortunately this year, what we can't get to get together, but I'm very hopeful so that next year we will be meeting again. Um, but for uh, tomorrow, we will have a slightly shortened day uh, finished at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, which is 11 o'clock uh, um, in China. Um, and because we have a shortened day, because we didn't have, we wouldn't have be able to have the conference dinner. Um, please do join us tomorrow. And uh, Lauren and I just, we just planning to have a, a, a cloud drink party. Um, uh, at uh, the finishing time tomorrow at three o'clock. Uh, I know that um, uh, Christina, you are in Romania, which is two hours ahead, which is perfect timing for you. Okay. Maybe you're ready for us to drink at three o'clock. Um, but yeah. um, I, I thought it might be a good opportunity so that we can open up all the mics and we can introduce each other. We can know each other. This is an opportunity for us to, uh, uh, to put together as a network. Thank yeah. you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, happen. Sorry? I said, thank you for still make, uh, make this conference happen during this no Yeah, yeah. We, we, we changed uh, the conference. The original conference was uh, going to be on curating, but I thought we, we, we need to be more, you know, uh, interesting. Um, bang on the topic. Let's discuss about the COVID. Um, and the curating uh, conference will happen next year. Um, and I, um, I will uh, keep you updated. And very hopefully that I will see all of you tomorrow um, at um, nine o'clock in the morning. Okay, bye.